Yo guys, welcome to the Zelda Fiction. Today we are gonna see, what if Naruto was the golden king and led his kingdom. Huge shout out to Maki K for this story. If you end up liking this video, please consider subscribe, so without further ado, let's get into the video. Late at night, in the royal palace of Yuzushio, many people were waiting with batted breaths. The queen was going through labor, giving birth to their Yuzushio's throne. The process was a long one, but soon everything was over and the future king was born. When the doctor washed the prince, rinsing water through his golden blonde hair, the baby opened eyes, making her gasp. My queen. The prophecy. The prophecy is true. Soon the child was given to the exhausted queen who looked at her baby, his crimson eyes with slip pupil looking around aimlessly. The eyes of the first king, Kishina muttered under her breath. She remembered the prophecy she received when she became pregnant. It was shown to us. The first king of Yuzushio, the wise King Gilgamesh, has chosen your heir as a vassal for his power. Beware, enemies of Yuzushio, as our future king will be not blinded nor betrayed. Kishina didn't fully understand what the prophecy meant for her, Naruto, or her kingdom, but that all could come later, for now, she was content, lying next to her son and resting. Sadly, this was not all for tonight, the resealing of Kayubi would commence soon, she had to get ready. During the early morning in the village hidden in the leaves, a silhouette of a young boy could be seen sitting on the Hokage monument. To be more precise, the young man was sitting on the head of the Yonadame Hokage. Upon closer inspection, one would see the boy had golden hair, standing like blazing flames and blood-red eyes with a black slit pupil. Three whisker marks adorned both his cheeks, giving him what many would describe as a wild look. He wore a silk-white shirt with three-quarter sleeves and silky black pants. Black civilian shoes, a golden necklace, and a pair of golden earrings that unlike any other earrings, were solid gold squares. In one word, with an outfit like this, no one would ever take this person as a shinobi, more for a son of a nobleman. That wouldn't be so far-fetched, but instead of being a son of a nobleman, he was a noble himself. Not just another noble, however, but a king. Yes, this boy, who couldn't be older than twelve was a king, king of Yuzushio. His name was Yuzumaki Naruto, the absolute and sole ruler of the Yuzushio, an island between the land of fire and the land of water. Naruto sat in silence, overlooking the village his father protected with his life, his red eyes scanning the crowds of mongrels on the main street of Konoha. To think, him, a king will be walking amongst them very soon was preposterous. Yet, he knew the reason why, after all, he decided to come here and become a shinobi of Konoha. Of course, he wouldn't be staying here for long, he had better things to do, and being a shinobi would only be so much useful. The blonde closed his red eyes and took a sigh, already feeling the headache that was coming when he came back to Yuzushio. It's time already? He asked out loud. He heard a faint noise of someone appearing behind him and looked over his shoulder. A young girl, about the same age as himself, was standing with her arms crossed. She had blonde hair pulled in a ponytail by a red hairband with two bangs framing her face and green eyes, which Naruto would often compare to emeralds. She wore a white tube top with blue trimmings that exposes her abdomen and a crimson leather jacket. She wore light jeans short shorts and high black boots, and a leather necklace with an Yuzushio symbol. This was Mordred Pendragon, member of Yuzushio's elite Kingsguard's Knights of the Round Table, and his personal retainer. She came from one of the noble houses in Yuzushio, and after proving her talent and strength at the age of 10, she was accepted into the King's Guards. Her history with Naruto starts far earlier, however. The two know each other since childhood, always training, learning, and playing together, the two of them were almost inseparable. Even after Naruto's coronation as the King of Yuzushio, their bond didn't falter, and Mordred could confidently say that she was one of the few people with whom Naruto would act normally. Ah, my coronation, it has been two years already. It was a day like every other in Yuzushio's capital city, Yurik, that is until Naruto went to greet his mother, Yuzumaki Kishina, the queen of Yuzushio, in her chambers. When he knocked and his mother didn't answer, the blonde was confused. Kishina always stood up earlier than him, having duties to attend early in the morning. The blonde couldn't remember a single day she had slept in. Naruto opened the door slowly and called out. Mother. I'm coming in, he opened the door and went in, only to be met with an empty room. Now this was confusing, she always waited for him in her chambers, and after this, they would go eat breakfast. His musing was cut short when he heard a voice behind him. Naruto-sama. The blonde turned around and saw a maid standing in the doors. He didn't remember her name, he never bothered to learn the countless maids' names that lived in the palace. What is it? He asked, his crimson eyes focusing on her, making her stutter. Speaker Began, I have other things to do, how he hates when people stuttered, couldn't make up their minds, and acted shy. In his eyes, people with no confidence were useless, simply wasting his and others' time. Maybe that's what made him like Mordred, she was confident no matter what. 
My lord, Yamamoto-sama has requested your presence in the main throne room, Yamamoto Junyusi Ashijikuni, one of his mother's advisors, a veteran that once served in the King's Guard, fought a war, and lead Yuzushio's forces to many victories. Revered and respected, Genyusai came from a civilian family, yet Naruto's grandfather recognized his powers and wisdom, allowing him to advance quickly through the ranks, putting trust in the back then young knight. Yamamoto didn't fail, putting the kingdom before anything, ready to sacrifice himself at any moment. When he retired, his mother offered him to become one of her advisors, a position he chooses with gratitude, doing his best to help Kishina guide the kingdom, always there to give his share his wisdom and experience. I see, I shall be going then, return to your duties, the maid bowed and left quickly without another word. Naruto started going towards the throne room at a relaxed pace, pondering what the old man wanted. When he arrived, he instantly knew something was going on. The throne room was in complete silence, the different countries standing with unusual serious expressions, the knights of the round table were all present, amongst them Mordred, who joined a few days ago. The blonde tried to catch eye contact with her, but she held her head down. Naruto saw Yamamoto standing next to the empty throne that was elevated by a platform. Yamamoto, why did you call for me? The blonde called, his voice loud and unwavering, just like always. My lord, I bring sad news, Naruto experienced something that he didn't feel in a long time. Was this fear? Slowly he started to connect the dots. I am most saddened to inform you, our queen and your mother, Yuzumaki Kishina, has passed away tonight. Just as we predicted, the resealing of Kayubi inside you weakened her body, and tonight it couldn't handle the lack of Kayubi and gave in. The silence followed. Naruto knew that this day was coming, his mother told him, and if this was not enough, he saw it with his own eyes. This was the power bestowed on him, the gift of clairvoyance, the ability to see futures. The blonde closed his eyes for a second and took a deep breath. I see, then we will hold the funeral before my coronation. As you wish, my king, Yamamoto kneeled, soon followed by every other person in the room. The funeral will be held in three hours. The coronation will be held tomorrow at noon. The time went quickly, the funeral was a big affair, the news of the queen's death spread quickly. When she was buried, the whole kingdom mourned their benevolent queen's passing. But as soon as the depressing mood came it went away as quickly, people of Yuzushio were awaiting the coronation of their new ruler with bated breaths. When the time came, Naruto was prepared. He donned a full armor made out of gold with dark blue markings and black cloth underneath. Two solid squares of gold, his favorite earrings were present along with a red waist cape. His golden hair that usually flowed down was spiked upward. The blonde entered the throne room, a red carpet leading towards the throne. Courtiers, nobles, and other notable members of his kingdom, as well as delegations from other countries, were standing on the sides of the carpet. Closest to the throne were the knights of the round table, five of the most loyal and powerful warriors from Yuzushio. They were the highest ranking officers, getting orders only from the king and no one else. There was no hierarchy in the king's guard as all of them were viewed as equal. Currently, only five people held this title, they were Mordred Pendragon, Yuzumaki Yoshitsu and more commonly known as Ushuakamura, Kichiki Bayakuya, and his younger sister Kichiki Rukia and Yuzumaki Ichigo. When the door opened, trumpets began to play, gaining everyone's attention. The blonde did not later in his step, walking towards the center where his advisor and the great prophet were standing next to the throne. When Naruto walked up the stairs, all became silent, even the bird outside stilled as if nature itself was watching with batted breath. The great prophet was an old man who cared about all religious matters in the kingdom. It was him that foresaw Naruto's gift of clairvoyance among other things. His prophecies helped Yuzushio many times, telling of many dangers and catastrophes that were to come. The man took the crown into his hand and kneeled in front of the blonde, extending his hand holding the crown upwards, for Naruto to take. The blonde grabbed it without hesitation before lifting it in the air. This was a sign all previous monarchs did, showing the gods and deceased that they were the ones who would be carrying the crown. Naruto turned around, the crown still in the air, and looked at his subjects. It was hard to believe, just a few days ago he would be in his study, learning about the responsibilities that he was supposed to take on right now. He would lie if he said he wasn't nervous, after all, he was just 10, his mother died yesterday, and the small seed of self-doubt was always present ever since he remembers. But not now, the moment his armored hands lifted the crown, all feelings of anxiety, self-doubt, or fear vanished. He was certain now, this was his future, this was his responsibility, his kingdom, and he would lead it forward no matter what. His subjects would prosper under his rule, leading to a golden era for Yuzushio. With his resolve steeled the blonde scanned the crowd and looked in each of his subjects' eyes, lingering for a moment on Mordred before placing the crown, his crown on his head. The moment the golden crown touched his head, all fell to their knees. All hail Yuzumaki Naruto, the one and only king of Yuzushio. Yamamoto stated loudly, his voice echoing through the large room. All hail the king. All hail the king. 
all hail the king. Trumpets along with other instruments started to play, a choir singing, people speaking with excitement filling their bodies, and among this all, a small smile bloomed on Naruto's face as he sat on his throne surrounded by his subjects. Boy. Naruto. Naruto. Damn it, Goldie. Mordred shouted in front of his face, snapping her fingers and waving her hand. Said blonde finally came back to earth and noticed Mordred in front of him. Uh. Was his intelligent response before narrowing his eyes at his companion for using this nickname, making Mordred Fasipum before snickering. The other blonde gained a tick on his twitching eyebrow. And what are you laughing about? He shouted, pointing his finger at her, demanding a response. Just imagine what would happen if anyone else would hear your response. Just imagine, the always serious and arrogant king answering with a stupid uh, just like another mongrel, she said and laughed even louder. Don't you dare compare me with some mongrels. I am Yuzumaki Naruto and... And you will be late for your first class if you stay here, his retainer finished, making the blonde look at the soon with a confused look, which soon morphed into slight shock, seeing how true her statement was. He was about to rush before reminding himself and smirking confidently. HMPH, I am king, if I am late the mongrels should await my arrival. He spoke confidently only to look at Mordred confused when she shook her head. Nope, you forgot. One of the rules for you being allowed into the academy is that you will be expected to act as another student, so no one will wait for you. That is also why you are wearing normal clothing, well as normal as you would allow it. I doubt anyone else would be wearing the most luxurious materials while attending a ninja academy, Naruto cursed before the two started making their way towards the Konoha Shinobi Academy. Naruto's eyebrow twitched to lower himself to be on the same level as mongrels, it was blasphemy. But he would endure for now, after all, for his kingdom, he would lower himself to this level. After the Third Shinobi War, Kano has stood as the sole winner, defeating all its enemies and being hailed as the strongest hidden village. They won thanks to many sacrifices, tactical genius, heroes like Yondai Mei Hokage, the Sandiner Kakashi Hot Aki, and powerful allies, Yuzushio foremost amongst them. But the other hidden villages exhausted after the war and with powerful allies, Kanoha could conquer the world, yet it didn't. The reasons were the peaceful policies of the Sandai Mei Hokage, who wished for peace in the elemental nations. The same policies were the reason for Kanoha's power decay. The academy curriculum was changed to fit more for the civilians, and the entry age was raised in hopes of giving the children more time to enjoy life. Currently, unlike the other villages, where the entry was at 6 years old, in Kanoha the youngest one could enter was 10. Previously to the Ichiha massacre, it has been 8, but the fears of another child like Itachi raising through the rank too quickly forced the academy to change once again. Academy students would spend six years in the academy, learning the basics of shinobi arts from chunins. However, most clan children already started their training at the age of seven, giving them a rather large advantage over the civilians. While Laruka was a teacher only for few years, he could confidently say he never felt nervous at work, well, not counting the first two weeks as a teacher. He was nervous when he was told to become an assistant teacher for the class with the Hyuga prodigy. Even when he got his own class, full of clan heirs, the future of the village he wasn't as nervous as now. The scarred Chunin just left the Hokage office, being informed about two students being transferred into his class. The aged Hokage didn't say much about the two, just to listen carefully to their introduction and believe every word they say. Already this put Aruka on the edge, but it was the next statement that made Aruka truly nervous. No matter what, don't let anyone, no matter who, anger the boy otherwise you will have at least once fewer students in your class that made Aruka really nervous, but he would have to make a good impression. The Chunin entered the classroom, not seeing yet anyone new and with a sigh, he didn't know he held, he started preparing for class. Few minutes passed before the class started to quieten down, and the first lesson was about to start. The scarred Chunin was about to start the roll call, but was rudely interrupted by a loud sound of the door being slammed open. Everyone's attention turned to the door, looking at a pair of blondes, one wearing revealing clothes, while the other looked like he just came from a photoshoot. This is Aruka's class, I presume? Naruto asked, a smirk sprouting on his face upon seeing the surprised faces of his future classmates. The Chunin looked at the two and nodded. Yes, I am Yumi no Ruka, everyone, those two are new students who will be joining our class for the remaining four years, this, as expected from the Chunin, made many of the students shout in an uproar. What? Why are they allowed to skip two years? Who the hell are they? Aruka was about to bring the class to order before the blonde girl scowled. Shut the hell up, you morons. She roared, her voice shutting everyone in the classroom. She smirked upon seeing their reaction, that is until a particularly arrogant civilian stood up. Sensei, who the hell does this guy think he is? Even me, a counselor's son wasn't allowed to skip the first year, and he just comes here and is accepted after skipping two years the boy shouted, pointing an accusatory finger at the red-eyed blonde. 
Iruka saw a scowl form on Naruto's face and reminded himself of the Hokage's words. His eyes widened, but before he could do anything, the blonde opened his mouth. Do I think I am? HMPH, it seems no even one of you, mongrels, realizes who is standing in front of you. He shouted, his voice thunderous daring anyone to interrupt him. Even Aruka was not willing to step in now. However, I shall forgive your lack of knowledge. Hear me, as I shall not repeat myself. My name is Yuzumaki Naruto. Son of Yuzumaki Kishina and Nami Kazi Minato. The glorious king of Yuzushio. The blonde stated, his arms spread wide, smirking at the students' astonished faces. Their shock was interrupted when the other blonde walked up, her hands on her hips, a confident grin on her face, showing her elongated canines. My name is Mordred Pendragon, one of the knights of the round table, and my king's retainer, Iruka looked with wide eyes at the two, recognizing their names and titles instantly. His heart hammered in his chest as he finally realized what task he had been given by the Hokage. The chunin broke out from his stupor when Naruto's bloody cat-like eyes focused on him and bowed to the blonde. It's an honor, your majesty. It was going to be stressful the next four years, the chunin thought, observing how everyone was looking at the two blondes. Some with amazement, disbelief, and others with elocity and envy. After the roll call Iruka began his lecture, going on about the first shinobi war, describing the Nidame Hokage's sacrifice to save his squad and deliver vital intel to the village. Naruto could have carried less, the past couldn't be changed, and what mattered was only present and future. And while the death of a hero was maybe something new for the others in the class, Naruto had met with this on more than one occasion during his two years rule. In this short time span, Yuzushio lost many people, all of who will be remembered as heroes, even if only by Naruto. His train of thought was interrupted when his left palm was talked from under his chin. Cat-like eyes shot open and narrowed on the only possible person to do this. Mordred, he growled, and his eyebrow twitched when she stuck out her tongue. No sleeping, Goldie, we are going out for Tujutsu training, she said with a grin. Naruto raised an amused eyebrow and smirked. Oh. What do I see, the great Mordred is excited to fight against academy students. He teased causing her to punch his arm and cross her arms. HMPH. As if. I am not excited, merely wanting to put some of them in their places. They have been glaring at us for some time. Now come, it is unbefitting of a king to be last. The king is never late, it is merely the mongrels who are early, the blonde stated confidently, following his retainer who sighed with a defeated expression. Soon the two were standing on the academy's training ground, and in the middle was a circle acting for a ring. The class surrounded it, and Aruka briefly reminded everyone of the rules of the spars. He then proceeded to pit civilians against one another, noting the results and giving his insight on the fight. As went through the class and the time came for the clan children to fight, Mordred stepped forward. Oi! Sensei, I want to fight this one, she demanded pointing at Inuzuka Kiba, whose surprise quickly turned into a confident smirk. Hey ah, are you sure, Mordred san? When the girl just entered the ring with a large smirk, the Chunin turned to Kiba, who followed her, telling his Ninkin to stay away. Please remember no killing, crippling blows or... Yes, yes I got it, leave the mud able to attend the next lessons, Mordred cut off before cracking her knuckles. Come on, at least make it a bit entertaining, Kiba growled and prepared himself to lunge at the blonde. It seems someone needs to be shown their place. With this, the brown-haired boy rushed forward, for some civilians simply appearing out of nowhere in front of Mordred, before lashing out without his power, wanting to end it in one punch. The punch that has been stopped effortlessly by the girl. The Inuzuka's eyes widened when he saw this. Is this all? Really? I know you are slow, but I at least hoped you would have some strength, the girl muttered before kicking him away. Kiba gasped as his back hit the ground before rolling to a stop. He stood up shakily, clutching his left ribs and breathing heavily. The winner? Not yet. The boy shouted and rushed once again, putting all the power he could muster. But even his fellow students noticed how much slower he became. His initial swing missed when the blonde tilted her head a tad back. He tried again, this time, however, his punch hit its mark. A small smile formed on his face when he felt his fist meet flesh, but as soon as he looked up it turned into a look of horror. Mordred took his punch, letting it hit, yet it didn't even make her head turn. A wicked grin formed on her face, and she prepared her punch. My turn, her attack was so fast, no one besides Naruto and Aruka saw it travel, the power behind it creating a big gust of wind. Her fist stopped inches in front of the boy's widened eyes, his hair ruffled by the punch pressure. Mordred clicked her tongue and walked away. Be thankful I can't cause any permanent harm on you. During the whole fight, which didn't last longer than a minute, no one's attention turned away from the ring. From Naruto's amused smirk, through Choji's and Shikamaru's concerned looks to Sasuke's narrowed eyes, everyone witnessed Mordred humiliate the second best into Jutsu without so much as effort. Even Sasuke, with all his confidence, wasn't sure if he could take her on and win. 
The other spars went quickly, Naruto was supposed to fight Shikamaru, but the black-haired boy instantly forfeits, saying how big of a drag it would to fight him. After all the spars were finished the class went back to the classroom, where after another few hours of lectures and theory lessons Naruto and Mordred were allowed to finally leave. On their way home, which is the late Yandium's house, Mordred sighed heavily. The blonde looked at her with a quirked eyebrow. What is it? Sad you didn't get to beat more people. He asked teasingly. No, I just realized how much I hate lectures and that we will have to listen to them for the next four years, she groaned, and dark clouds started to hover over her head. Maybe you will learn something useful like you know, how to plan ahead of battle, instead of always rushing headstrong in and hoping for the best. What was that? Do I gotta remind you about how you never plan anything when it comes to battle? No, but you know very well why I do not need plans. No matter who I fight against, they stand no chance, you should know this very well, he said with a small smirk, causing Mordred to narrow her eyes on him. Is this a challenge? Well I would gladly show you again the difference between us, there are more important matters to attend. For example. Seriously? He asked, looking at her with a deadpan expression. I have a whole kingdom to rule. Hey, you can do this later, first we fight. The green-eyed girl said with excitement, which vanished when the other blonde shook his head. No, during our class, I had a vision and I have new orders for the round table. As soon as we are back, send for a messenger, hard times are coming for you Zushio and we need to prepare. Late at night at his father's house, Naruto gave a tired sigh. He looked at the stacks of papers on his desk and couldn't help but mutter a prayer for help. It seems his absence caused many of his subjects to become tardy with their paperwork. This, however, resulted in him having even more work, leading to his current predicament. Naruto leaned back in his seat, thinking about how nice it would be to take a warm bath and rest. He stayed this way for a moment before giving another heavy sigh and getting back to work. Allowing expansion of the commercial area by destroying an old apartment complex, distributing money from the kingdom's coffers to families whose members died as his knights and people in need, checking how much food they were able to collect this month and save for the future. As minutes turned into hours, the blonde started sighing papers and giving orders automatically, like he did so many times before. His attention was suddenly drawn to the small burning sensation on top of his hand. He looked over, noticing a small red seal and a scowl. This was his chance, his master has given him an opportunity to show his loyalty and power. He just had to kill a single brat, a king he called himself. The person scoffed at such a notion, he was nothing more than a pampered and arrogant kid with powerful people under him. He saw his destination, the house of the late Yan Daimei. A grin formed on the person's face. Yes, just a little more and he would go back oh his master, who would bestow more power on him. He would finally be recognized and not held back by this village. Without wasting any more time, the person jumped over the wall around the residence, landing in the huge backyard. Moonlight lit the yard for a moment, showing the person's silver hair held under a bandana with leaf insignia on it and a chunin garb. Before the person could take a step forward a projectile flashed and hit the ground in front of him, creating a hole and kicking up dust. As the smokescreen slowly started to vanish, the person coughed up before being blinded by golden light. They protected their eyes from the light and looked where it came from only for their eyes to widen. On top of the house stood a black silhouette, behind them golden ripples, looking like portals shone with the brightness of the sun. Oh, a vermin dares to trespass on my territory. Bloody, slitted eyes glared down on him imperiously. Under the brightness of coming from behind him, Naruto was easily able to identify the intruder. It was Mizuki, one of Chunin instructors at the academy. Naruto had no idea what the idiot was doing in his backyard, but he was too tired to care. The silver-haired man seemed to regain his previous confidence as he smirked and took out a small vial from his pocket. Nothing personal, kid. My master wants you dead, but don't worry, at least you will be able to see the power he bestowed upon me, without waiting anymore, the Chunin stabbed his arm with a syringe. Not a moment later purple veins appeared on his body, the man himself clutching his throat in seeming agony. Naruto let it play out, curious what would be the end result, and to say he was surprised would be a small understatement. Where once stood a normal Chunin now crossed between a man and a large lion. The humanoid creature had silver fur that covers building muscles. The beast's eyes black eyes turned on him, and it let out a feral roar, alerting half of Kanoha to its presence. It didn't seem to care about the ruckus it causes as what once was Mizuki prepared to leap at the blonde. See, this is the power of my master. Now I will rip you to shreds. The beats roared and jumped towards Naruto. That is, until it was stopped, not even a meter away from the ground by a golden spear hitting it on the chest and pushing it back. The push was powerful enough to create a small trench, from which the beast came in a blink of an eye. Naruto raised an amused eyebrow when Mizuki roared and the small bruise on his chest healed. See now, boy. Nothing you can do will harm me. I am unstoppable. 
Once again it jumped forward the blonde, this time coming half the way before being stopped by another weapon, this one being a golden lance. The weapon tore through the beast's chest, spurting blood on the grass and pinning it to the ground. Nothing I can do will harm you. You deduce this after I attacked you with one of the weakest weapons in my vault. Naruto asked incredulously before bursting out in laughter. Mizuki growled in anger as he tried his best to stand up, but the lance wouldn't bulge. How amusing, mongrel. It has been a rather long time since one of your kind was able to make me laugh. I shall reward you for this with another chance. The lance promptly turned into golden particles, freeing the beats. It stood up, not minding the pool of blood under it or the rapidly closing wound in its chest. After I finish with you my master will recognize my worth and give me more power. He should have done that before sending you here, the young king answered as he noticed more and more shinobi gather around his residence, looking at the golden portals in wonder. A proud smirk formed on his face as even more ripples appeared around him. Before you die, I will allow you to glace at what real power is. Behold, the gate of Babylon. Instantly, dozens of weapons of all kinds shot out from the ripples. Swords, lances, spears, maces, bows, shields, throwing knives, arrows. All aimed at the mongrel who dared to interrupt his work. The moment before his demise, Mizuki could only look at the incoming weapons with a single thought. Beautiful not a breath later the large humanoid was completely obliterated, nothing but a pool of blood left of him. Opening of King's Vault This is how the Shinboys who witnessed the spectacle called it. There was not a single person in the whole village who didn't hear about it. All who saw it were spreading all sorts of rumors and descriptions, causing many to look at the blonde with respect and fear. The civilians looked at him with uneasiness, shinobis with respect while children, no matter if civilians are from clans, looked at him with awe. This is what led to the current predicament. The blonde and his companion, Mordred was walking down the market, heading to a small Raymond bar the female found yesterday. Suddenly, they stopped as a group of seven children, no older than six appeared in front of them. Naruto looked at them with a small smirk, while Mordred was annoyed at being delayed by a bunch of brats. Hey, get you, the green eye blonde was stopped when her king placed a hand on her shoulder. When she looked at him with a raised eyebrow and was about to ask what he wanted, one of the children stepped forward and bowed. My king. Please show us the gate of Babylon. The boy stuttered, but it was his request that shocked everyone on the street. Many heads drew instantly to where the children were standing in front of the blondes. Many civilians felt worried for the children, who knew what Naruto's reaction would be. If it was anything like Mordred's, who looked ready to explode on the children, then it would end badly. Naruto looked at the mongrel who dared to ask him such thing, but seeing the nervous but hopeful expression on the boy's face caused Naruto's cat-like eyes to soften. Very well, I shall allow it, a small golden ripple appeared above his hand before a golden necklace with a Konoha insignia dropped out of it. The blonde looked at the gobsmacked children with an amused smirk before throwing the necklace to the boy who dared to ask him to show his precious vault. Thank you very much, with a large grin the boy bowed before running back to his friends who were talking about the necklace and the gate of Babylon. Naruto saw Mordred giving him a knowing look before he scoffed and turned away. Oh, big bad Naru has a weak spot for children, the green-eyed knight teased with a grin before tilting her head out of a small dagger's way. Ah, as if you don't have a weak spot for them. Remember when you allowed this little girl to ride on your shoulders and call you Nichan, Mordred Nichan. Naruto stated with a grin, causing the other blonde to splutter and blush. Don't call me that. Oh, Nichan, but wh the blonde had to duck under a punch. He looked into his Mordred eyes, which were glaring at him with promises of very painful death. Oops, I might have overdone it the blood-eyed blonde chuckled nervously. All you can eat today. Mordred's eyes instantly turned into stars before she dragged her friend over to the Raymond stand. Once there, Naruto sweat dropped at how long his companion's order was, crying silently how much it was going to cost him. The blonde duo spoke about most mundane things, enjoying each other's presence on their day off. Yugako was not someone who often got nervous, in fact, it was very rare to see him express any emotions. He was a branch member of the clan and a caretaker of the Hyuga heiress, Hinata, as such, he had been trained how to control his emotions for years. But as he reminded himself what he was going to do, he couldn't help but feel a pit in his stomach. It was a normal messenger duty, go tell them whatever Hiyashi-sama wanted and begging. He had done it countless times, from speaking with farmers, through famed diplomats, and even a few times with Hokage-sama. Yet, as he approached the Raymond stand where Yuzumaki Naruto and his retainer were enjoying themselves, the brown-haired Hyuga couldn't help but feel nervous. It wasn't just the idea of who was going to speak with, but the message and what it would mean for Hinata and the Hyuga clan as a whole. Clearing his throat, the Hyuga announced his presence to the two blondes. Naruto-sama, my deepest apologies for interrupting you, but my lord, Hyuga Hiyashi, sends me with a message, the Hyuga bowed low and waited for the blonde's response. Very well, I shall hear what he has to say. 
the Ashisama wishes to invite you to the Hyuga estate to propose a deal to you that might be most beneficial to you. HMPH, when does he want to hold the meeting? The day, in three hours. Very well, I shall be there, now Began. With another Bo Cole left the Raymond stand rather hurriedly, a relieved sigh leaving his lips once he turned a corner. The brown-haired ninja started walking back to the Hyuga estate to give Naruto's answer, all the way musing what the blonde would say to Hiashi's offer. Back in the Raymond stand, Mordred scowled and turned back to her Raymond. Her friend noticed the sour expression and placed a hand on her shoulder. Mordred, what's wrong? It's not fair. It has been so long since you could take a day off, not bothering with paperwork, training, or meetings. And now you will have to attend this stupid meeting. Besides, we were supposed to go to the movie tonight, she muttered the last part and looked away. Naruto sighed heavily, squeezing her shoulder, before sitting more closely to her and giving her a one-armed hug. I am sorry, but as a king, I can't decline such offer, especially from a clan like Hyuga, he muttered quietly. Mordred leaned into his hug, resting her head on his shoulder. They sat in silence for some time before Naruto muttered. I promise, I will make it up to you. The green-eyed blonde looked up at him with wide eyes. You promise? She asked, uncertain, knowing how much Naruto's promises meant. He cupped her chin with his free hand and gave her a rare smile. I promise, after all, you are my most precious person, Mordred blushed heavily, before looking away muttering about stupid blondes making her flustered. Naruto smiled fondly at that and let go of her and stood up. Come on, we still have three hours to enjoy before I have to go, he extended his hand to her, which she took with a big grin on her face. Yuga Hanabi was a prodigy, maybe not at the same level as her causing Niji, but a prodigy nevertheless. In comparison to her older sister Hinata, she was stronger, more confident, and more prepared for leading their clan, yet, Hinata still was the heiress. Many would suspect Hanabi to be jealous, angry even at Hinata and her father for this, but that was not true. If anyone asked her what she felt towards her sister, the young Yuga wouldn't be able to answer. She didn't hate her sister, but she wasn't particularly fond of her. While Hinata was caring and kind, she was also weak and shy, so much unfit for a Hyuga head. Because of their training, in both shinobi arts and politics, the two sisters rarely got time which they could spend together, yet if the occasion would arise, neither was doing any steps to arrange any together time. Hanabi snapped back to reality when a branch member informed her that she was summoned by her father. She walked the corridors in science, thinking what he ashi could need from her, but couldn't find any answer besides asking for her weekly progress. When she arrived in front of the door, she knocked twice before being beckoned to enter. Inside was sitting her father and a young blonde she instantly recognized as the wise king of Yuzushio. Dusama, Yuzumaki-sama, she bowed and closed the door behind her. The Nabi, goes to see who this is. From now on, he will be your tutor. You will follow learn from his about the responsibilities of a leader, learn politics and train with him and anyone he deems as good training partners. HMPH, so you want me to prepare her. Very well, from now on, you will be honored to be under my tutelage, the blonde-haired boy said with an arrogant smirk. The brown-haired girl looked with wide eyes between her father and the young boy, before swallowing hard and bowing her head. It has been some time since Naruto spent so much doing mundane things like shopping in his free time. Ever since he can remember, his life was filled with training in all aspects of battle, especially swordsmanship, tactics, stealth, how to read the battlefield and deal with stress, learning how to run a country and play politics. Naruto didn't do it because he liked the idea of working every moment of his life. He did this because when he turned four, he had his very first vision, in which he saw that at the age of ten, he would ascend to the throne. This came as a shock to the blonde and for some time he didn't believe it, passing it off as a simple dream, not wanting to believe he had the ability to see the future, but also that his mother would die so soon. However, when he saw the same vision for the second time, more vivid than before, and during a day, when there was no chance he was sleeping, Naruto was crushed inside. After retreating to his chambers and making sure he was alone, the blonde let his emotions run wild. Anger, sadness, despair, fear. He knew he couldn't save his mother, the cause of her death was the simple fact that her body was unable to live without the QB chakra, that was the effect that awaited all Jinchuriki that had their beasts pulled out of them, and there was no cure for it. It was a miracle in itself that Kashina was able to live over ten years without the Kyubi sealed in her, but the moment he was born, all citizens of Yuzushio knew that her reign was coming to an end. But only Naruto knew when she would die and when her duties would become his. And so, knowing that he had limited time and learning as much as possible to become a good ruler for his people, the red-eyed boy focused on his studies and training. It was also somewhere this time around that he had for the first time met Mordred and got his ass handed to him in a spar. Mordred, for the lack of better words, was wild. Naruto remembered fondly their first meeting, during which to his surprise, the other blonde seemed not to realize who she was meeting. 
Other noble-born children yes, Mordred was a noble, even if her manners didn't indicate so acted like it was expected of them, they were to make a good impression on him and hopefully forge good relations. Mordred, on the other hand, not only did not know he was the prince on the island she lived on, but also bluntly insulted him, calling him an arrogant pompous jerk. Naruto did not allow this insult to go unpunished and challenged her to a duel, sure of his victory. The results were not only humiliating but also painful. It was the first time Naruto had been so defeated, and while laying on the floor, bloody and bruised, he couldn't help but think how refreshing this was. This in turn made the blonde laugh, calling being beaten up refreshing was something only a madman would say, yet here he was. And so, after telling Mordred who he was and hearing her say that she would beat him again if they fought and that she was not going to apologize, Naruto came to the decision to befriend this wild girl. Following his coronation and taking control of the kingdom, Naruto had even less time to call free, since even if he was not working in his study or training with Mordred, he spent a lot of his time in the throne room, sitting, listening to his subjects' woes and pleas or simply using his clairvoyance. Clairvoyance was an interesting ability, it granted the blonde a look into the past, present and future, and while seeing the past and present was rather easy and enjoyable, looking into the future was tiring. Because of all the things that are happening in the present, the future is ever-changing, and there are countless possible futures. Looking into them, Naruto was unable to discern which would become the present and which would not. The endless possibilities, anything could happen, all depending on how the present would be played out. During his two-year-old reign as the king of Yuzushio, Naruto had used clairvoyance several times to avoid small disasters that would end in more paperwork for him, but there have been some events he didn't see and was unprepared to deal with them. Visions were something else. They came to you randomly and gave only a limited amount of details, usually about events that were still some time away, just like it was with his mother's death or the great prophet's vision about him. Visions were something to be not taken lightly, and in light of recent events, Naruto had to make sure to prepare for the last vision he received, this is exactly why he was at the Hyuga clan manor. After finishing their raiment, Naruto spent about two and a half hours with Mordred before deciding to head to see what deal Hiashi had to offer. Naruto, still in his costal clothes, hands in his pockets, walked towards the gate of the Hyuga estate and saw two guards standing outside. Hiashi is expecting me, Naruto stated with a bored expression. Honestly, he would rather stay with Mordred, but his duty called, and as such, he had to at least hear what the Hyuga wanted to say. Usually, Naruto would scoff at the notion of him having to go meet someone and not the other way around. He was a king, if someone had business with him, they came kneeling in front of his throne and spoke only when he allowed it. But Naruto knew of the Hyuga's pride, since it the second only to his own, and understood that Hiashi asking for an audience was already a great blow to the Hyuga's pride, one that would take a long time to heal, at least for the Hiashi. You shall address Hiashi-sama with respect. One of the two guards, who looked to be in his teens, stated with a frown. His fellow clanmate froze and looked at the blonde and not a small amount of fear. Who allowed you to address me, you mongrel? The red-eyed king asked with a scowl, crossing his hand and peering straight into the Hyuga's Byakugan. The guard, angry at the way he was being called was about to resort until an otherworldly amount of killing intent filled the area. For a moment, his vision became blurry and the world around him spun, the Hyuga guard blinked once, and the killing intent vanished like it was never there. A moment later, said guard realized he was no longer standing but kneeling, his hands holding his from hitting the ground. He looked up and a pair of slit crimson eyes were glaring at him, pinning him in place. Know your place, worm, without another word, Naruto scoffed before walking into the compound, the other guard quickly called a branch member to lead the blonde to Hiashi's room. Naruto was led to a room in the main building of the compound before being left alone by the servant. He knocked twice before sliding the door and entering the room. The room was big, at least by normal standards, filled to the brim with scrolls and books. In the middle of the room was a single large desk behind which Hiashi sat, doing what seemed like paperwork before lifting his gaze. When their eyes met, Hiashi put his work away and focused on the blonde. Your Majesty, Hiashi greeted, giving a bow if it could be called that. For most, it would be merely a nod, but slightly lower. For a Hyuga, this was the lowest their pride would allow them to be. The Ashi, Naruto greeted back and sat down in front of the clan head. The black-haired man clapped twice and a servant walked in, pouring tea for the two before leaving without a word. For the whole time, the two sat in silence, one with his eyes closed and the other watching the servant pour the tea, looking for any mistake that might need to be corrected in the future. Blood Red Red opened and stared at the Hyuga clan head for a moment before Naruto sighed and started talking. Speak your mind, Hiashi. I neither have time nor patience for your usual political talk, well yes, the blonde was taught how politics works and how to discuss with other important people, that was before he became the king and the vaults of his ancestors opened to him. 
Since then, he had no equal, his word was the law, and the law was his whim. Very well, I shall get straight to the point. The Huga clan is in dire need of help. As it is known, the Huga is currently the strongest clan in Kanoha, no other clan can rival our numbers or might, not one ever since the Achiha clan massacre. And with this position comes the inherent risk of being the village's first line of defense. As it is shown in Kanoha's history, the strongest clan is always the one that suffers the most during wars. At to the point, I grow tired of listening to your ramble. I was told you have a deal to offer, and that is the reason I came here," Naruto proclaimed with a slight frown, his cheek resting on his left fist, his gaze holding the pale eyes of Hiyashi, daring him to waste more of his time. The older man coughed to clear his throat before straightening back and starting to speak again. I propose a deal, an alliance between the Hyuga clan and the kingdom of Yuzushio, silence followed the statement. Naruto's eyes never left Hiyashi's, rooting the man in place. When Naruto still did not give an answer, the Hyuga began to sweat slightly under the pressure. He was a politician, he was taught how to deal with stress and other emotions, ever since he could talk. Yet, he couldn't help but fiddle under the watchful eyes of the young king, looking for even the smallest hints of weakness, like a predator watching its prey. Naruto closed his eyes for a moment before chuckling lightly. The black-haired shinobi looked at him uncertainly, not sure if this was the reaction he was hoping for. Your deal has caught my interest, I shall allow you to explain whatever you need to explain," Naruto said with an amused smirk on his face, he leaned back and let the man speak his mind. The current generation of Kanoha shinobi is frankly a disappointment and embarrassment. They are all twelve, an age where they should at the latest become genin and start to amass experience. Yet, they are still just in the middle of the academy curriculum, even if the clan children are trained, it still doesn't change the fact that by the time Kanoha's generation starts their careers, our enemies have already four years of experience and personal training. I understand your dilemma, yet I do not see how this ties back to our deal. With the current generation being unprepared for war, it will be the duty of the Hyuga, as the strongest clan, to be on the front line in the next war. But I am afraid this would be the end of my clan. Kanoha, as you might know, has the second lowest amount of shinobi among the five great villages, but we always made up the difference with very skilled prodigies that rose during the crisis. This generation doesn't have anyone like this. There are two prodigies in this generation, Ichiha Sasuke and Arhuga Niji, yet neither of them is a shinobi, or could be compared to a real prodigy like Hot Aki, Yandai Mei Sama, or the Sanin. I see, so you want me to assure Hyuga clan survival should a war break out. Naruto asked with a small scoff, yet the amusement from earlier did not fade. He rose an eyebrow when Hiyashi shook his head. No, should a war break out, I want the Hyuga clan to be allowed to join your kingdom as a subject. You would betray your village during their hardest times to assure your own survival. Now, this was it, Naruto always loved to see how low humans were able to go to protect themselves, holding on to their dear lives like cockroaches. If betraying Kanoha means the survival of the Hyuga clan, I will not hesitate. The older man said with steel resolution and the blonde couldn't help but laugh loudly. Naruto clutched his sides, trying to calm himself down, still giggling under his nose. Ah, now I see, he calmed his breathing down. Well, I will see what can be done, but tell me, what do I and my kingdom get from this? Negotiations took some time, around two hours, before the two came to an agreement. In exchange for giving the Hyuga clan asylum, should a war break out, the clan would open trade with the kingdom at very good prices for Naruto's merchants, as well as paying a percent of the clan earnings to Yuzushio, discreetly of course. The Ashi also offered a tribute of gold and silver to the blonde, in exchange for tutoring one of his daughters, which was an offer the blonde considered declining for a moment before changing his decision, having heard Hiyashi's reasoning. Why would you ask me for this? Surely, you can teach your heir yourself. Naruto asked, truly puzzled why the older ninja would be so desperate to ask for his help on this matter. The Hyuga sighed and massaged his temples. My older daughter and heir, Hinata, is very shy, to the point of being barely able of speaking with people. She is meek and lacks resolve, if nothing changes, she will not be able to lead the clan in the future. I tried to help her, to teach her, but her lack of talent in the Hyuga style and her shy nature made it impossible. Naruto listened to what the Hyuga had to say, playing around with the cup filled with now cold tea. Once the man finished, the blonde scoffed and shook his head. I have neither the time nor desire to take care of a child of that nature. If she truly is as you described her, I would start looking for a new heir, Naruto answered making Hiyashi sigh in defeat. That is something I and the elders have considered for some time already. Hinata's younger sister, Hinabi is the complete opposite. She is confident and learns quickly, I dare say she might even rival Niji in talent, but it's too soon to say this yet. If you are not willing to teach Hinata, then maybe you would consider her younger sister. How old is she? 
She will be 8 this summer, there was silence for a few moments before Naruto started laughing, confusing the Hyuga. After a few moments, the blonde calmed down and sighed. How amusing, never have I thought I would see the Hyuga have their heir trained by someone outside their clan. Very well, from today on, I shall mold Hanabi into a worthy clan head, you may feel honored, Hiashi bowed his head slightly, thanking the blonde. Call her in, I wish to see what I am working with. The Hyuga clan head sent a servant to fetch Hanabi, meanwhile, the two sat in silence. They didn't have to wait long, after about four minutes, there was a knock on the door. Enter. Hiashi ordered and the door slid open, revealing a young girl. She had brown hair, reaching her shoulders, and was wearing a simple white kimono with the Hyuga clan's crest on the back and held by a dark blue obi sash. She looked from her father to Naruto, recognition flashing through her pale eyes before she bowed. Dusama, Yuzumaki sama The Nabi, good to see that you know who this is. From now on, he will be your tutor. You will follow and learn from him about the responsibilities of a leader, learn about politics, and train with him and anyone he deems as good training partners. HMPH, so you want me to prepare her. Very well, from now on, you will be honored to be under my tutelage, the blonde-haired boy said with an arrogant smirk. The brown-haired girl looked with wide eyes between her father and the young boy, before swallowing hard and bowing her head. I shall give you a single piece of advice, I do not tolerate failure and disobedience, the red-eyed king stated before standing up and walking out of the room. As he passed a girl, he stopped for a moment and spoke without turning. You will appear from Monday to Friday at the Namikaze household at 5 in the afternoon. Without another word, Naruto walked out, leaving the two Hyuga alone. He headed for the gate, wanting to get back home already, idly he noticed that the sun had already set. Upon arriving back home, Naruto was greeted by a particular sight. Mordred, one of the most respected and feared knights in his kingdom, was fighting with a cat. The blonde blinked when he heard his friend hiss at the black feline, making it jump and ran away before the knight launched in pursuit on all four. Naruto smiled seeing her act so carefree and wondered what the other knight of the round table would say once they heard about this. Um, no one would believe it that was true, there was probably not a single person in his kingdom who would believe that. During her career as a knight, however short it was, Mordred had established herself as a powerful and loyal subject, just like the rest of the Kingsguard. She was widely considered as dangerous and proud, often even arrogant. Maybe I was a bad influence on her? Naruto shrugged, her arrogance was well warranted in his opinion. After all, the five current members were not only the strongest, but also the most respected warriors in Yuzushio. All knew their name and exploits, they were the role models for new and old knights alike. Only a few could ever hope to be even considered for the position. While becoming a regular knight was easy, just like becoming a shinobi, to advance in ranks, one had to have a natural talent and work harder than anyone else. And that was only for rising through the regular ranks, in hopes of becoming a lieutenant, captain, or general. These were the ranks in the army of Yuzushio, and compared to the Shinboi system, there were fixed amounts of positions for the higher ranks. The structure of Yuzushio's army was as follows. There were five generals, each having about a thousand knights under them. These one thousand knights were split into ten groups, each led by a captain, making it about one hundred soldiers for a captain. Each captain had five lieutenants, each of them leading a squad of twenty regular knights. General had seniority over the captains, who in turn commanded the lieutenants. All three ranks had different responsibilities in the army. The lieutenants led their squads in the battle and trained them during peace. The captains gave general orders to their lieutenants, making sure there was no discontent in the army, as well as providing logistics for their underlings. The generals were the main battle strategists, making the calls during battle about when to advance and when to retreat, as well as keeping everything running smoothly. The knights of the round table were not a part of the main army. They were the personal guard of the king, but oftentimes joined the battlefield, and when they did, they had seniority over the general. Usually, the king's guard acted more like advisors to the general before joining the front lines, but there were exceptions, like Mordred, who merely ordered the general to not get in her way before rushing headfirst into the fights. How one advanced through the ranks was an easy affair. Each officer designed their successor in the case should they die or retire. For example, and general designed one of his ten captains as his successor, and said captain chooses a lieutenant, who in turn chooses a regular knight. Should the general die, the captain becomes the new general, and the lieutenant becomes a captain, and the regular knight takes a position as lieutenant. The king of course could always give or take the positions himself, but Naruto so far had deemed it unnecessary and let his officers do it themselves. Becoming a knight of the round table, however, was far different. In theory, anyone could become a knight of the round table, just like Mordred who didn't hold any position in the army before. Usually, all members of the king's guard are recommended by a captain, general, or another member. 
It became a norm that any knight that is powerful or does a great feat is considered, and if the current ruler deems them worthy, they are given the honor of joining the round table. Naruto smiled fondly remembering how Mordred got recommended about three years ago. It was quite the day in the royal capital for Naruto. Not only was he woken to the news of his mother being absent, having gone on some diplomatic meeting on the mainland with the three of the knights of the round table, but he was entrusted with her duties for the day. Now, the morning had been fairly peaceful, having done some paperwork, leaving the important ones for when Kashina was back and meeting with a few of his future subjects, Naruto thought the day would stay this way. That all changed when the doors to his study were burst open. Naruto tensed, the gates of Babylon opening instantly, ready to shred the intruder into pieces, should he be hostile. Naruto blinked however when a young man fell to his knees in front of him. He was wearing the standard grey armor of the Knights of Yuzushio, but with the distinct blue markings around, indicating his allegiance to the Third Army. The man was on his knees, gasping for air and sweating, trying to cough up words, of which the blonde understood none. Fed up with the man wasting his time, Naruto narrowed his eyes and spiked his killing intent for an instant, making the knight stop speaking. Calm down and take a breath, the man did as commanded, taking a few moments to control his breathing before straightening up and kneeling in front of the blonde. Now, speak your reason for taking up my time. I, I was sent by my lieutenant to deliver a message. A revolt of unruly peasants led by a few deserting knights has risen up on the South Island. The garrison has been overwhelmed and I was sent to ask for backup, Naruto sat silent for a few moments, before clenching his fist and standing up, a scowl marring his face. The South Island. The man nodded and the red eyes prince told the man to rest in the main barracks. Leaving his room swiftly and heading towards one of the many gardens around the castle, he couldn't help but grumble under his breath. There have been some rumors about discontent on said island for some time now, ever since a disaster struck. A small tsunami had crashed into the island, destroying three villages and killing many people. The reason for their anger was that his mother had assured them that the seals on the coast would protect them from such a thing happening. Feeling betrayed, they must have waited for her to go away to stage their revolt, something Naruto had warned his mother about, but she believed that once she helped them rebuild they would calm down and their blood wouldn't have to be spilled. Naruto had seen the piece of Fuinjustu with his own eyes and knew that it should have worked and it was proven by the other islands, of which there were seven in total. There was the main island, on which the capital was located, and was the largest one of them. There were the south, west, east, and north islands, smaller than the main island, but not as small as the northwest and southeast islands. These seven islands made the Izushio kingdom and were under his mother's and in the future his authority. To hear one of them dared to revolt was not something the blonde was willing to let off the hook. And so, if the seal had failed it meant someone must have done something to either destroy or turn it off, most likely the deserters. Arriving in one of the bigger gardens, Naruto scanned the area, and his gaze stopped at a figure sitting under the shadow of a tree. Upon closer inspection, it was a girl a little on the short side with a slim body figure that is slightly thick around her chest. Something that instantly catches one's eyes are her long black hair that could nearly touch the bottom of her feet, that was straight, and because of its length, it put up in a style that would avoid it from touching the ground. Along the right side, she had a thick ponytail that is kept together by a yellow Indian-looking hairpiece. In the front, her hair lays down in little strips just touching the ends of her eyebrows. The lower you look the longer those strips get. There were other hairpieces in her hair that are the color black, and at first, they look like her ears, reminding that of a cat's. With this, she has a red headband around the top of her head. Her outfit was something special. It consisted of a revealing samurai outfit that would gain a lot of attention from both men and women even on the battlefield. Her outfit consists of the colors white, gold, blue, and black. Over this, she wears a white samurai cloak that matches easily with her white and gold top that covers her neck, shoulders, and chest. Around her waist, she wears what looks like a red, black, and gold belt attached to a layer of white clothing. Her left forearm was covered by a purple sleeve that ended at her biceps, and on her other arm, the same garment could be seen but in white. Her right half was also covered in a dark blue glove. This and her white socks and most curious Jetta sandals made out of dark fur complemented her look. At her waist was a sheathed katana, and she wore light blue panties. A and 1. Naruto always wondered where did her special attire come from, and why she would wear such revealing clothing, but never got around to asking her this. Shaking his head, the blonde walked over to the girl, who opened her beautiful dark blue eyes, and smiled upon seeing him. Ushuakamaru, this was Yuzumaki Yashitsune, more commonly known as Ushuakamaru, one of the four knights of the round table. Let's go, without another word, Naruto spun on his heel and started walking away towards the palace's entrance, leaving behind a confused knight. Wait up, Naruto-sama. The girl shot to her feet and ran after her prince. What happened, where are we going? Naruto scoffed as they walked down the hallways. 
Some mongrels have deemed it safe to revolt during mother's absence, the black-haired girl cringed hearing Naruto use the word mongrel. It was a known fact around the kingdom that the blonde had no mercy for people he called this way, and only death awaited them. She narrowed her eyes at the motion of people rising against their rules, gritting her teeth. Such insolence. Without another word, they headed south on foot. Usually, Naruto traveled with a horse, since who was he to run around? But this was an important matter and every moment mattered. The revolt had to be crushed before it spread or killed more of his people than just the garrison. It was late in the afternoon when the two arrived on the South Island. They had run the whole distance here, not stopping even once. Upon entering the island, golden particles lit around Naruto before his full golden armor appeared on him, the red waist cape billowing in the wind. The two walked through the island towards the small garrison, and upon getting close, they heard the sounds of a fierce battle. I was told the garrison was wiped out, let's go, they rushed towards where the sounds came from. The whole area stank of fresh blood and death. Naruto and Ushuakamaru landed on the wall surrounding the garrison, and the dark-haired knight whistled upon the site. The place was a battlefield, dead bodies covered the area, and blood soaked into the ground in copious amounts. Among the bodies, Naruto saw that most of them were simple civilians that took any weapons they could find, but also some of his soldiers. They got closer to the center of the camp and found a single knight in a suit of bulky armor covered in red decorations and markings. The armor came with a horned helmet that hid the person's face, and the knight held a single regular broadsword. Even though the armor and sword looked heavy, the masked knight moved with speed and agility like it weighed nothing. A and 2. Across the night were what must have remained from the rebellion. A few dozen civilians with weapons had faces like they saw a demon, and rightfully so. The night that fought against them was covered in fresh blood that shone in the afternoon sun, and the broadsword that took many lives of their comrades, even though it was cracked already, probably didn't help their fear. Among the people were six knights, all of them still wearing their army armor with green markings, signs of wear and battle showing on them. The deserters from the second army, was it squad six or seven? No matter, they will die Naruto saw the knight in red was about to lung forward the battle, and he decided to finally make his presence known. A single gate opened above his right shoulder before a beautiful golden spear shot out, hitting the ground in front of the knight in red, stopping him in his tracks. Both parties jumped, the knight of red because of how close and fast the weapon appeared, and the rebels because they realized it was reinforcement for the demon in front of them. However, what none of them expected was to find the prince himself standing in all his glory a short distance away. His crimson eyes displayed his rage at the rebels as his presence started to overtake the battlefield, striking even deeper fear into them for at that moment, all of them saw their death. Oh. What do I have here? A few mongrels daring to rise against my mother's rule. Naruto shook his head as a small smirk found its way on his face before he turned to the knight. You have done well, my loyal subject. Rejoice, as you shall witness the treasury of your king. Naruto swung his right hand before dozens of portals opened and only what one could call a massacre started. Weapons of all shapes and forms shot from the golden portals and aimed at the civilian rebels, killing them all in seconds. It took only ten seconds before the few dozen civilian rebels were nothing more than a massacred pile of corpses. The six knights stood frozen, they all heard about the prince's power, but hearing about it and seeing it used against yourself were two different things. Ushuakamaru, I left these six for you as payment for taking you with me. Crush them. Show them no mercy. The knight of the round table was more than happy to slaughter the traitor that dared to rise against her queen understood, Naruto-sama. The crazy, bloodthirsty grin on her face struck the fear of God into the remaining six knights that were forced to defend themselves or die when the dark-haired knight crossed the battlefield, intent on not letting a single one of the alive. It ended swiftly, with all of their heads rolling on the ground and Ushuakamaru at his side in about a minute. It was a testament to their skill that they managed to last this long, Naruto had seen the female knight bulldoze through twice this many knights in seconds. It was a shame they decided to revolt, they had some potential. But this done, the red-eyed prince turned to the last knight and frowned, crossing his hands across his chest. The knight kneeled in front of him, and they stood so for a moment before Naruto sighed. So he dragged the word long enough to show his displeasure. Why are you here, Mordred? The helmet of the knight retracted to reveal the blonde hair pulled in a ponytail and the green eyes of his best friend. She didn't look at him, afraid of what his reaction would be. If there was thing Mordred had learned about her fellow blonde, is that he expected his subjects to obey him and not take any actions without his permission. Even though he was still only the prince, he held a lot of influence, and only his mother could overrule his decisions. And that was exactly what she did. She had been on the main island near the port city on an errand when she saw the messenger. She instantly knew something was wrong, the fear and anger visible on his face showed her that something wrong has happened. 
As she was close to Naruto, he often told her about some information that was supposed to be only for the high-ranking officers, such as the fears of a revolution on the South Island. Upon noticing his blue markings that showed he was from the Third Army that was stationed on the South Island, she pieced it all together before rushing towards the battlefield in hopes of putting the revolt down. And she did this without saying a word to another person, not only abandoning her current duty, but also taking a major decision without Naruto's permission. I she scowled at the ground, clenching her fist that rested on the ground. I saw the messenger and knew the people of this island rebelled, so I decided to put it down, there was silence for a few moments during which Ushuakamaru walked over to stand behind Naruto. I see now, Mordred couldn't discern the emotions in his voice, but before she could think more about it, he spoke again. To think the one person I trust the most do something like this, his voice was soft, and she closed her eyes, ashamed of her actions, no matter how noble the intentions were. I think you deserve to be punished, don't you think, Ushuakamaru? I agree, the mentioned black-haired girl had her eyes narrowed at the girl in front of her. For her, it was unthinkable to do anything like this without the queen's or the prince's permission, their word was the law, and she would rather commit seppuku than do something without their blessing, especially something as important as rushing toward the battlefield. Very well, for your treachery and disobedience from this day on, there was something else in his voice now that Mordred heard. Wait. Was it you shall be known as the Knight of Treachery? I think this is a fitting title, this blonde idiot. She looked up only to see him giving her an amused smile, his eyes filled with mirth. Of course. He promises to get her back for annoying him a week back when he was studying. Ushuakamaru blinked once and then a second time, confused as she expected a more grave punishment. She looked at the prince's smiling expression and sighed. Well, what was I expecting, it is his precious Mochan after all the night thought with a light smirk. It was a well-known fact in the court that the Pendragon heir had a special place in the blonde's heart, being the only person he ever called a friend and comrade. You. I can't believe you. Mordred yelped, with a glare and a red face. She shot to her feet pointing her finger at the prince. You scared me there to death, you blonde moron. Naruto only laughed at her embarrassed face before calming down. So, how many did you kill? He asked, genuinely curious about his friend's achievement. Mordred scratched her head before shrugging with a grin. Dunno. Stop counting after 200. Oh. And I killed three of two knights. She said with a proud smirk. The red-eyed prince was surprised and honestly happy before an idea struck his head. Turning to the blue-eyed knight he looked at her with a knowing look. The feet worthy of the round table. Mordred sputtered in shock while Ushuakamaru hummed, looking over the countless bodies littering the place. Honestly, this was nothing compared to what Bayakuya and Ichigo had done to be granted the position, yet it was something that was on par with what gave herself and Rukia the title. I think it might be, Ushuakamaru nodded her head with a broad smile. Mordred, still shocked was unable to muster any answer, making Naruto laugh once again at seeing the ever-confident and proud Mordred in such a flustered and shocked state. Very well then. Once we get back to Yurik, I shall make it official. Naruto stated proudly spreading his arms with a smirk. By Ushuakamaru's recommendation and by my authority from today on, you, Mordred Pendragon, the Knight of Treachery, shall be granted the position at the round table. Rejoice. I thank you, she muttered before kneeling in front of her friend with a single tear in her eye that alluded to two others. I shall do my best to serve you as a loyal subject. Come on, let's head back to Yurik and have someone clean this up, as they walked towards the nearest port city, as they were not being in any particular rush, and Naruto decided to take a ship, Mordred couldn't help but ask one question. Two about my sword. Naruto chuckled and shook his head. We will wait until mother comes back with the other knight of the round table for the proper ceremony, Mordred pouted at this, and he couldn't fault her. It was a custom that each member of the round table was gifted with a special sword from the vault of Yuzushio. Well, that was the case until he was born and opened the gates of Babylon. Naruto decided that any new members would be given a single treasure from his personal vault as a show of the blonde's appreciation of their loyalty and strength. As it stands, Mordred would be the first one, and the green-eyed knight would lie if she would say she wasn't excited. She had seen with her own eyes the amount of overpowered and amazing weapons Naruto had at his beck and call, and couldn't wait to see which one he would give her. Now, if she only could make him change her title everything would be perfect. Yet, her last wish would not be granted, and before long, her title would be spread among the army and then the rest of the kingdom, making many wonders the reason for such a title. Naruto sat down on a very comfortable looking armchair with a sigh. Wordlessly, a golden portal opened next to his hand before a single golden chalice appeared, and the blonde grabbed it. Mordred quirked her eyebrow at her friend and sat on a couch across from him. So, what did the Hyuga want? The knight was curious if it was important enough for ruining her time with Naruto. Well she would never admit it, it was her favorite thing to do, just spending time with her king, not having to think about responsibilities, just enjoying themselves. 
There was a silence for a few moments during which the blonde sipped on the red liquid in the chalice. How did he call it? The Holy Grail. Mordred never asked about it, she was more interested in the crimson liquid, which turned out to be wine. Something the blonde indulged ever since his mother passed away. Not that it impaired his duties as thanks to the biju inside of him, it was almost impossible for the young king to get drunk, tipsy at most, and even then, only if he drank a lot. He always said he merely drank it for the taste, and she believed him. The wine from his gate of Babylon was truly something else, it tasted nothing like the wine one could purchase, and Mordred would drink it more often, but unfortunately, she is considered what is called lightweight. The last time she and the blonde drank together, she woke up to a ruined garden, filled with trenches, trees, and bushes destroyed while maids and servants looked at her fearfully. And let's not forget the headache. Oh, the embarrassment. Luckily for her, Naruto was amused enough by her drunk antics, he helped her alleviate the headache with another concoction from his treasury. At first, she was against drinking anything else from the gate of Babylon, but after the red-eyed blonde gave her his word that it would help, she decided to trust him and was not disappointed. Back on the matter at hand, she listened as Naruto explained the deal between him and the Hyuga clan head. She narrowed her eyes at the part where the Hiashi was prepared to leave Konoha behind and scowled when he told her how some girl is going to be learning under him. What? Do you really need to have some little girl following you around? Naruto sighed and stared at his friend, who had the decency to flush and look away with her eyes crossed. Hey, and what about promising a place in Yuzushio to unloyal ninjas? He sighed, looking at the wine in his chalice, crimson like the blood in his visions recently. First off, I never promised him anything, I merely said I would see what can be done. Their offer benefits the kingdom, but who knows when their deal becomes useless or outweighs its worth. It's not like I can see the future, right? Besides, if what I saw is indeed true, then there won't be time to help them, Naruto closed his eyes, contemplating what the future holds. Lately, even his clairvoyance had been acting weirdly. While could still peer into the different futures, all of them were cut off or became very fuzzy about five years into the future. It was the first time something like this had happened to him, and it's not like he didn't look so far ahead. Once, when some young noble questioned his gift of clairvoyance, the irritated blonde decided to teach the fool a lesson. He gazed 24 years into the future to see how the noble would die. The next time they met each other, Naruto simply told him the exact day, down to the very hour, and how he died. Apparently, his family usually died around the same time from some kind of sickness that was passed down, and only their family was supposed to know about it. The fact that Naruto not only knew about it, but the fact that he was just told how much time he had left spooked the man to the point the man was too afraid to ever look at the blonde again. And what about the girl? Hmm? Ah, yes, do you fear I would replace you with her? The blonde asked with a raised eyebrow, an amused smirk on his face. His fellow blonde sputtered and crossed her arms. Ha! As if I care what you do, Goldie. Besides, I am Sir Mordred, the strongest knight in the kingdom of Yuzushio, I know neither fear nor defeat. She stated proudly, puffing out her chest, making Naruto laugh at her antics. I'm sure there are some people who would contest you on the title of the strongest knight in our kingdom. Ah! There is no one stronger than me in the round trouble. Baikuya and Ushuakamaru are fast, true, but Baikuya doesn't have the strength to cut me down, and Ushuakamaru doesn't have the endurance to fight me. Rukia. PFF. She relies too much on Majutsu, I would crush her. Ichigo. Well, he is good but doesn't excel at anything, besides he has no true combat experience. Naruto listened with a small smile, it was always fun to listen to Mordred talk about other people's shortcomings and never mention her own. But her bipasis was not false. While all of them would be considered an air rank in the shinobi world, only Mordred strived to become even more, something that would need to be rectified in the near future. Well, I cannot say that I disagree, but maybe you should think about starting to learn at least some basics of Majustu. Majustu, also known as Magecraft, was developed by the first inhabitants of Yuzushio, long before the Sage of Six Paths. Unlike the ninja techniques, the ancient Majustu didn't require the user's chakra and instead used the natural energies of the world. That of course, made it possible to use only for a handful of people, and once humans had gained chakra, they started developing a new way of using Majutsu. They still kept the principle of using natural energies, but mixed them with their own chakra. While this made it easier to use and more people started to learn it, the overall power of Majustu was lowered. Magecraft was a secret technique for the kingdom, and only selected few that were able were allowed to learn it. Thus, an institution was created to teach and safeguard the secrets of Majutsu, the Mage Guild. The guild was an organization localized in the city of Navori, on the main island of Yuzushio, and was led by the Council of Mages, who swore their allegiance to Naruto. Well, they were not part of the army, for the institution was battle-oriented, but more like a place for research and development, the members of the guild knew that should a war come, they might be called to defend the kingdom. 
For that, we would need to head back to Yuzushio and we are currently stuck here, remember? Besides, you still didn't tell me why we are here, and I doubt that you just want to play being a shinobi for a corrupt ninja village, Mordred asked, sprawling on the couch and munching on cookies she purchased before. Um, you are right, I am not here to become a shinobi, but I have to be here, for it is my duty as the king of Yuzuhio to make sure my subjects' lives are safe, Naruto answered, getting a quizzical look from his fellow blonde. Didn't you say that the people of Yuzushio are there for you and not you for them? Naruto chuckles lightly and got hit with a pillow for it. What are you laughing at? Don't worry, I just remembered someone. Anyway, yes, I am not there for the people of Yuzushio, but they are there for me. It is their duty to act as my subjects, they belong to me, just like the whole kingdom, no, the whole of elemental nations is merely my garden to do as I will. My divine right to rule does not only go for the kingdom, but for the whole continent. You planning on conquering the world or what now? The Knight of Treachery asked with a confused expression. Never before had she heard the blonde say something like this, he always only spoke about Yuzushio, and that is as his. Naruto sighed and closed his eyes in deep thought, thinking about how to explain it to his friend. No, I am not planning on conquering it. The whole is my garden which is my divine right, something that was given to me by King Gilgamesh. Had I not been born to inherit the throne, I might have decided to subjugate the whole world, but I can't. As the king of Yuzushio, my duty is first and foremost to my kingdom, to make sure its legacy continues and my subjects live in prosperity and peace. Isn't that contradictory? No, look at it this way. The people of my kingdom are like my treasure, they do what I tell them to, they fight when I tell them to, and die when I tell them to. They do so, because they are mine, but like with a sword, you have to polish it, like with a chalice, you have to clean it, like a pet, you have to feed it. As my treasure, I have to take good care of them so they can continue to serve me to the best of their abilities. So, am I just another treasure to you? She asked quietly, making the blonde open his eyes slightly and look deep into her eyes. If you were a treasure to me, you would be my most precious jewel, one that I would never anyone else to gaze upon, but no, you are not. You are the most beautiful flower that I can ever hope to obtain or control, my most prized companion, my friend and confidant, and the only person worthy to stand next to me. That's what you are to me, Mordred. Naruto smiled seeing the blush grow on her face, even when she tried to hide it with a pillow. But it was the truth for him, she was the only person worthy of being at his side and never could look at her like a treasure, because for Naruto, treasures were to be used and once they lost their worth discarded, not something he could ever do with her. You still didn't answer my question. Thinking you can throw me off with your honey word, you bastard, her voice was muffled by the pillow as she peeked over it at him with narrowed eyes, making Naruto laugh. I guess I didn't. Very well, in short, Yuzushio, while powerful is an anomaly in this shinobi world, a relic of the past that this new model of shinobi villages would like to snuff out and bury. Well I am certain that we are untouchable with me around, what happens once I am gone? The villages will band together to destroy it, something I can't allow. Do you really think something like this would happen? I don't think, I know, that once we lose our one and only ally, the other villages will mobilize and turn on us. To prevent this, Kanoha needs to stand as our ally. And we are here to prevent it from being destroyed. Yes. When will it happen? In five years, during the Chunin exams. Huh, can't we just come then and deal with it? Naruto sighed and shook his head. No, if I come as the king of Yuzushio, Kanoha still ends up destroyed. The only way for me to help it is to be during these exams as a shinobi of Kanoha. How come? The box where I and the Kages would sit will be encased in a particularly powerful barrier, from which I wouldn't be able to escape, for which I would need to use enough power to level the whole village, which is the opposite of my goal. So, I will need to be someone taking part in the exams to have the freedom to help the leaf. Wouldn't you be sitting with the daimyos? At this, the blonde barked out in laughter. Don't jest, these clowns, the daimyo, all of them are merely puppets. While well, they have their armies of samurai and money, they are dependent on the villages, and the five kage hold the real power, at least in the great five nations. To put me at their level is insulting. The two fell into a comfortable silence, just relaxing in the other's presence until Mordred asked another question. Does the Hokage know? Of course not, I came here, declared we will attend the academy, and made him sign the paperwork, the two blondes burst out laughing together, before retiring for the night, having academy in the morning. The end. So how was this part, I hope you like it. And if you like it share this part with your friends and like the video too. And don't forget to subscribe our channel for daily awesome fanfiction. Okay it's time for me to go. Bye bye.